In the last class, we learned that the believers in Christ are one body, united by their faith. John wrote in his gospel that if we believers are to demonstrate our unity, the world will be more inclined to understand, recognize and accept Jesus Christ. We also saw that God loves us as much as He loves the Lord Jesus Christ. The love which we have received from Him should prove to the world that we are His children. We also heard that one of the reasons God created humans was so that He could have fellowship with us. This is a comforting thought for Christians who should take heart in the knowledge that God desires a relationship with us. We should seek to deepen our relationship with God through prayer, worship, reading of His Word, etc. The mission of redemption, including Christ's death for our sins, is part of God's larger plan to have fellowship with humanity. And the goal for believers is to behold the glory of the Lord Jesus in heaven. This also tells us that each person has something valuable to offer and that each person's unique skills and talents should be used to further God's kingdom on earth. We can seek to use our gifts in service to others and can so forth the character of God in our conducts. Then we move on to chapter 18, a band of believers consisting both Jewish and Roman authorities led by Judas came asking for Jesus. The Lord shows them of His awareness of the conspiracy by asking them who they are seeking rather than what they are doing. When they say they are looking for Jesus, the Lord simply says, I am He. At this self-identification proclamation, they all fall, showing them that He is in control of His arrest, trial, and eventual death. It is His own will that this has to happen. Today, we will study about the trial of Jesus and the events surrounding it. Dear friend, there are several cups mentioned in the scriptures. There is the cup of salvation. It says in Psalms 116 verse 13, I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. Then there is the cup of consolation. It says in Jeremiah 16 7, Neither shall men give them the cup of consolation to drink for their father or for their mother. Then there is the cup of joy. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. This cup, which our Lord was to drink, was given him by the Father. It was a dreadful cup. And Jesus prayed in Gethsemane, O my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Matthew twenty six thirty nine, A dreadful cup. This is the cup of judgment he bore for us on the cross. Everyone who turns his back on Jesus Christ must drink that cup of judgment himself. Jesus drank it for us, although it was totally repulsive to him. Remember that he was perfect. He was perfect humanity, absolutely sinless. And yet he drank that hated cup because it was the cup of your sin and my sin. There is still another cup, the cup of judgment, which is yet to come on this world. I believe the seven vials or bowls of wrath which are to be poured upon the wicked as described in Revelation are the fulfillment of this. It says in Psalm 11 verse 6, Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire and brimstone, and an horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. Psalm 11 verse 6. This is the cup of his anger, it says in Jeremiah 25 verse 15. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel unto me, Take the wine cup of this fury at my hand, and cause all the nations to whom I send thee to drink it. Notice again what our Lord says to Peter. He says, Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? It is not, he is a judge and I am going to drink it by command. But, he says, shall I not drink this cup my father gives me? There is no willingness higher than that. Let us not get the idea that the Savior did this reluctantly. Hebrews 12.2 says, Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Well, let's continue now. 
in John chapter 18 verses 12 onwards. Then the band and the captain and officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him and led him away to Annas first, for he was father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. The religious rulers were the ones who had plotted all this because they were afraid of the people. Our Lord went outside the city to give them the opportunity they needed to arrest him. He is going forward in his dignity and in his glory. They took him and bound him, which wasn't necessary. He is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He is a sheep before the shearers. He will not offer any resistance. They led him away to Annas first. Only John gives us that detail, as apparently he was in a position to see something that the others didn't see. Annas had been the high priest and was probably still in the quarters of the palace of the high priest. Secular history testifies to the fact that Annas was one of the most brilliant, one of the most clever and one of the most satanic of all the high priests. Caiaphas was the one whom the Roman government accepted. But the real head of the religious group was old Annas. I believe that he was the real leader, a politician who knew how to handle Rome. It is my judgment that it was he who plotted the arrest, the trial and the crucifixion of Jesus. The entire trial was a mockery and I think Annas was behind it all. What an injustice has been done, the Jews down through the centuries. They have been blamed for the crime of men like Annas, Caiaphas and Pilate. Romanism for centuries has called the Jewish people the Christ killers, which has been the basis for anti-Semitism in Europe. Yet, they are not any more responsible than the Gentiles are. In the final analysis, we all are responsible for his death. He died for the sins of the world. There should be no pointing of the finger at any race or group of people. Now Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. John 18.14 I believe John puts this in here to show us that it had already been predetermined that the Lord Jesus was to die. They had already decided that. Old Annas knew how to forge a charge against Jesus to get the death penalty from the Roman authorities. The whole trial was nothing but a mockery. First Denial by Simon Peter And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. That disciple was known unto the high priest and went in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest. That other disciple was John, obviously. John apparently had an inn with those in Jerusalem and this enabled him to get a pass for someone else to come in. I want you to see that John apparently was known in these circles and for John to go in there was no temptation at all. However, it was fatal for Simon Peter to go in there. He was standing on the outside when John got the permission for him to come into the inner court. I want you to see this little byplay at the palace of Caiaphas. Verse 16. But Peter stood at the door without. Then went out that other disciple which was known unto the high priest, and spake unto her that kept the door, and brought in Peter. John had influence, but Peter, the fisherman, nobody really knew, and he couldn't get in. John tells the girl at the gate that this is a friend of his and so he brought Peter in. John was at home but Simon Peter had never been in that crowd before. <laughs> Peter was a big mouth, he just has to talk. Remember, the other Gospels tell us that the girls spot him as a Galilean because his speech betrays him. <laughs> he talks too much, he's nervous in there. And a little wisp of a girl makes him deny the Lord. Now that is an application for us here. You and I have no right to put our little ideas of separation down on another believer. Another believer may be able to go where you cannot go. Here, for Peter, it was probably wrong for him to get there. Then saith the damsel that kept the door unto Peter, Art not thou also one of this man's disciples? He saith, I am not. She knows the followers of Jesus are there and assumes Peter is one of them. She bluntly asks the question as he is about to go through the gate. Aren't you one of this man's disciples? He says, I am not and walks on through. 
Verse 18. And the servants and officers stood there who had made a fire of coals, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves. And Peter stood with them and warmed himself. Outside the palace grounds the people are gathered, not many at that time of morning, but the guards are there to keep order. They build a fire, and Peter stands along with them, warming himself. The Trial Before High Priest The high priest then asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. This is verses 19 to 21. Jesus answered him, I spake openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whither the Jews always resort, and in secret have I said nothing. Why askest thou me? Ask them which heard me. What I have said unto them, behold, they know what I said. The scene shifts back to the trial of the Lord Jesus. Notice the dignity of the Lord Jesus. And when he had thus spoken, one of the officers which stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Answerest thou the high priest so? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why smitest thou me? Now he, the king of glory, is subjected to this kind of humiliation. He is yielding himself to die for your sin and my sin. However, he does call that attention to the fact that what they are doing is illegal and contrary to the Mosaic law. They have no witness that he has done evil, and yet they smite him. They are the ones who are breaking the law. For one thing, no trial is to begin at night, nor end at night. A trial is not to begin and end on the same day. They are not to strike a prisoner who has not yet been proven guilty. Verse 24, Now Annas had sent him bound unto Caiaphas the high priest. John puts this little verse in to tell us again that it was Annas who bound him. Annas is one who plotted and planned all of this diabolic plot. The second denial by Simon Peter. And Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. They said, Wherefore unto him, Art not thou also one of his disciples? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, being his kinsman, whose ear Peter cut off, saith, did not I see thee in the garden with him? Peter then denied again, and immediately the cock crew. We learn from the other Gospels how Peter went out and wept bitterly. I think that he caught a glimpse of the face of our Lord, all bloody and beaten, and he caught his eye. That is when he went out and cried like a baby. Notice these denials did not take too long a time. It is just a passing comment. Dear friend, think of that. How many times when we have the opportunity to stand up for the Lord, you know, we've either been quiet or just denied it, you know, openly. Think about the times when you've just walked away, when you could have said a word of caution, when you could have proved your allegiance to Christ, but you've kept silent. Isn't that denial? You know that if he was arguing with a kinsman of Malchus, he must have been pretty vehement. He denied his Lord. But thank God, the Lord was on his way to die for him and had already told him that he had prayed so that Peter's faith would not fail. Why is it that Simon Peter, who did a deed as bad as Judas, could make his way back to the Lord? Because he was a child of God, and it broke his heart to know what he had done. A child of God may get far from God, but God is never far from him. You may be dead to God, but God is never dead to you. He is always there. He is always available. The Lord never said to Peter, I'm sorry, because you failed me, I just can't use you anymore. No, no. But he appeared personally to Peter after his resurrection and he elected Peter to preach that first sermon on the day of Pentecost. There has never been a sermon like it. Thank God for a Savior and a Lord like that who shows unlimited patience. He will always take you back. The trial before Pilate. Then led they Jesus from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment. And it was early and they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. This is verse 28. There is quite an interesting byplay here that I want you to see. 
Here we see religion and the person of Jesus Christ side by side. Here is the one who has come to fulfill the Passover. He is going to die on the cross because they are bringing the death sentence against him. But because they want to eat the Passover, these men won't go inside the judgment hall. That would pollute them. They will not do that. Are they meticulously religious? Yet they are plotting the death of the very one who is the fulfillment of the Passover. My friend, how this should cause you to search your heart at this time? Are you merely religious or are you joined to the Lord Jesus Christ? There is another interesting byplay to watch here. The Jews absolutely would not go into the judgment hall and thus contaminate themselves, but they brought Jesus to be taken into the judgment hall to be tried. So here is the change of scene in this drama from outside to inside and inside to outside. Watch it. Pilate then went out. Verse 29. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again. Verse 33. And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews. Verse 38. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. This is chapter 19 verse 1. Pilate therefore went forth again. This is verse 4 of chapter 19. And went again into the judgment hall. This is verse 9 of chapter 19. He brought Jesus forth. This is verse 13 of John 19. Pilate didn't really like Jerusalem. He liked Caesarea better which is on the sea coast and has a lovely beach. During the feast, he would leave Caesarea and come up to Jerusalem, bringing his soldiers with him. Since he was the Roman governor, he was responsible for keeping order at this time, when the Jews gathered from all over the world. This was the reason he was in Jerusalem at the time. Verses 29 to 32. Pilate then went out unto them and said, What accusation bring ye against this man? They answered and said unto him, if he were not a malefactor, he would not have delivered him up unto thee. Then said Jesus unto them, Take ye him, and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death. That the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled which he spoke, signifying what death he should die. 29-32 to Pilate senses that something is wrong and he tries, as we would say, to get off the hook. He tells them to judge Jesus themselves. He couldn't understand what was taking place. The problem was that they wanted the death penalty and they had to admit that they were no longer the rulers and no longer had the authority to exact the death penalty. It is interesting that these men were forced to admit this after they had so arrogantly stated in John 8.33. We be Abraham's seed and were never in bondage to any man. John tells us that this fulfilled what Jesus had prophesied. He had told the disciples that the Jewish religious rulers would condemn him to death and would deliver him to the Gentiles. He had predicted this months earlier, but now he was here being brought to Pilate, the representative of Gentile Rome, by the religious rulers who wanted a death sentence. If the Jews had taken Jesus and put him to death according to their law, he would have been stoned to death. Psalm 22 again, and notice whether it is describing a death by stoning or a death by crucifixion. It is obviously crucifixion with the piercing of the hands and feet and the agonies of hanging on a cross. The only ones who executed by crucifixion were the Romans. Jesus had to be delivered to the Romans to fulfill Old Testament prophecy. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again. This is verse 33 to 35. And called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus had appealed to the head of this man, Pilate. He asked him the logical question of where he got this evidence. Pilate sneered at that and said the Jews had brought the accusation. Now Jesus will appeal to the man's heart. Jesus is dealing with him man to man. Pilate was dumbfounded. 
He couldn't believe there was someone claiming to be the king of the Jews and that they would have the audacity to bring such a charge. Pilate is out on a limb and wants to get off. He would like to help Jesus. He is inside the court alone with Jesus. The Jews are waiting outside because of their scruples about contaminating themselves. Pilate would be happy if Jesus would simply say he is not a king and would get Pilate off the hook. Who is on trial? Pilate or Jesus? Jesus answered, this is verse 36, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Let this word sink in, dear friend. My kingdom is not of this world. The preposition is the Greek ek, meaning out of. Literally, he said, my kingdom is out of this world. He is not saying that his kingdom is not going to be on this earth someday, as he is going to rule as king of kings and the lord of lords. And the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This is Isaiah 11 verse 9. But his kingdom is not going to be of this world system. It will not be a power structure built on politics. It will not come through worldly measures. It's not going to be built by war and turmoil and hatred and bitterness. Pilate himself was that crooked politician who bought his job and was a puppet of Rome. He hated the Jews, but he was afraid to offend them because he might lose his job. But Jesus will not come to his kingdom by political maneuvering or manipulation. Jesus said, if my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight. He was offering no resistance. Peter had tried to defend him, and Jesus had told him to put his sword in the sheath. He is not building his kingdom out of the present political system. Friend, neither you nor I nor the system of our organizations or churches cannot build his kingdom either by political means or by any other means. The Bible teaches us clearly that in this present age, Christ is gathering out a people for his name. These are the ecclesia or the called out ones, the church. They are called out of the world to live in the world, but not of the world. The time will come when the Lord will completely remove the church from the world. Then when Christ comes in his kingdom, he will establish it. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. <laughs> Pilate is definitely puzzled at this point. Jesus is, is talking and talking pretty straight out here and also pleading with this man. He tells him that an essential of his kingdom is truth. Listen to Psalm 45 verses 1 to 4. I speak of the things which I have made touching the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Thou art fairer than the children of men. Grace is poured into thy lips. Therefore God hath blessed thee forever. Gird thy sword upon thy thigh, O most mighty, with thy glory and thy majesty. And in thy majesty write prosperously because of truth and meekness and righteousness. Verse 38. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. Was Pilate a cynic? Was he simply puzzled? He stood in the presence of the Lord Jesus who was and is the way, the truth and the life. John tells us later in his gospel that he has written all these things so that we might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Friend, do you ask what is truth? Is he truth to you? Again, he took Jesus outside and declared, I find in him no fault at all. Verse 39 says, But ye have a custom, that I should release unto you one at the Passover. Will ye therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Notice, Pilate is desperately trying to escape making a decision. Let me release Jesus to you and that will settle it, he says. 
Then cried they all again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Pilate didn't even dream that these religious, so-called religious rulers, would urge the people to demand that Barabbas be released. The contrast between them was too great. The Bible makes it clear that Pilate was assured that Jesus Christ was an innocent man. Matthew chapter 27 verse 18 it says, He knew that for envy they had delivered him. 27 verse 24 of Matthew, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. Mark 15 10, For he knew that the chief priests had delivered him for envy. Then Luke 23 20, Pilate therefore willing to release Jesus spake again to them. Then Luke 23 verse 22, I have found no cause of death in him. Then John 18.38, I find in him no fault at all. John 19.12, From thenceforth, Pilate sought to release him. Acts 3.13, Pilate, when he was determined to let him go. In spite of all of this, Pilate did not have the courage to release him. Well, dear friend, how about you? Are you fighting the truth? You know in your heart who Jesus is. Peter denied. Pilate just gave in to the pressure. Well, dear friend, we face all kinds of difficult choices at different stages in our life. What would you do? Dear friends, the trial must be understood within the context of Passover, which is significant in interpreting its meaning. The Jews' avoidance of defilement by not entering the praetorium, the place where they sent Jesus, is ironic and emphasizes the theological importance of the feast. Throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus is depicted as the Lamb of God, the sacrificial Passover Lamb. The date of Jesus' crucifixion is crucial because it coincides with the slaughter of other lambs for Passover. The significance of Passover was transformed when Jesus died as the ultimate sacrifice for the sin of the world. The Lord's Supper, also known as the Eucharist or Thanksgiving, replaces the Passover meal in the church as a meal of the new covenant that declares the gospel and the redemptive sacrifice of Jesus. The Lord's Supper commemorates the defeat of sin, death, and the ruler of this world, and its symbolic elements include bread and wine, which represent Jesus' body and blood. No lamb is needed as the flesh of Christ is the prepared lamb. Also significant is that the other three Gospels accounts make mention of the Lord instituting the supper while inaugurating His new covenant. The original Passover meal consisted of four cups and the cup which ended it was called the consummation cup. When the Lord says, I will not drink of this cup until the kingdom in all its fullness came, it means the consummation of God's redemption, lay it in the future. So until that day, we will celebrate the Lord's Supper, declaring the gospel and the redemptive sacrifice of Jesus and His eventual return in glory. Mm -hmm.